So this one is addressed to uh, Stephen Gilbo, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and reads as follows. On behalf of the Public School Boards Association of Alberta, I would like to draw your attention to a pressing issue for your consideration. As you are aware, public school divisions are funded entirely by tax dollars. School boards strive to manage these funds responsibly and effectively. However, the introduction and subsequent increases of the carbon tax, and these are capitalized, have significantly raised operational costs for Alberta public school boards. While we acknowledge our shared responsibility to reduce emissions and lower our carbon footprints, this tax has placed a substantial strain on the budgets, removing necessary dollars out of the classrooms and is essentially an unnecessary tax on tax. There are tens of millions of dollars each year that cannot be used for the education of our students in Alberta alone, never mind the hundreds of millions each year across Canada. We request consideration for an exemption to organi organizations that operate on tax dollars or, at the very least, a carbon tax rebate similar to what is provided for private residences and small businesses. This would enhance our ability to invest in environmentally sustainable infrastructure and initiatives. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Look forward to your response. It's signed off sincerely. Dennis McNeil, the president, and he has copied all Alberta members of parliament, the Minister of Education, the Chief of Staff to the Minister of Education, the Minister of Environment and Protected Areas, Rebecca Schultz, uh, the Public School Boards' Association of Alberta members, as well as Troy Tate, the Executive Director and CEO of the Public School Boards Association of Alberta. Literally in the letter, to the point that Mr. Olkuri made about this non-existent federal school food program that has fed exactly zero kids, here we have an example from the Alberta School Boards Association telling the government of Canada, telling the Liberals, telling the Environment Minister that he is costing them millions of dollars in operating funds that could be used to educate children that could go to school food programs that instead is going to pay the carbon tax, literally on paper. This is August 8, 2024. It's not an old letter. It's a very recent letter sent over the summer as the school boards were required to do their budget. When even the school boards yeah. are saying you're wrong and they should have a carbon tax election, then you should just listen to the school boards. You should actually do what they're telling you to do. And the fact there are Liberal MPs on this distribution list that have gotten this, and there's been no action whatsoever that I have seen whatsoever offering them any type of relief, which means that there are schools in Alberta, those that do have school food programs that may be shutting them down because they can't afford them because of the high cost of the carbon tax. And not just my province, I'm sure there's other provinces where the high cost of the carbon tax that keeps going up $15 a carbon ton every single April 1st, where they're going to be shutting down programs, removing after-school activities, shutting down school food programs and school food lunches because of your carbon tax. And so what I said, people are fed up with it and they want a carbon tax election, which is why the sub-amendment is so timely to a hyper-partisan motion. That's why. That's why when I get letters like this from school boards, which is not the, you know, I would say it's not the typical group that would reach out to uh, conservative members of parliament or any, or any parliamentarians usually because it's education is a provincial area of jurisdiction. Uh, right there in the middle of the letter says there are tens of millions of dollars each year that can't be used for education of our students. Tens of millions of dollars. And I'll note, uh, Mr. McDonald, you are one of those brave liberal MPs who one time voted against the carbon tax in the chamber. And boy, how do people back home really like that too? And I want to give you that chance. I know you're not intending to stay with us for another, another round, and maybe you'll be another MHA provincially in Newfoundland, Labrador. Um, but hopefully you'll remember that too, that uh, the carbon tax hurts our people back home for no gain whatsoever. And the school boards in my province have made it perfectly clear where they stand on a carbon tax election, and that is taking money out of schools directly for no benefit whatsoever. They, they recognize they have a shared responsibility to reducing their carbon emissions, and schools are doing it. This is the public school boards all across my province who are um, officially now asking for relief because they call it, and they, you know, they rightly call it too. I, I note that uh, the, President Dennis McNeil rightly calls it exactly what it is, a tax on tax. 
doesn't call it an environmental plan, doesn't say that there is some type of benefit to the environment or will directly address climate change. He says in his letter it's a tax on tax. That's effectively what it is. And it's a tax on a school board and all the schools that have property, that have a building, so they, they operate year-round. They have heating costs, they have electricity costs. Some of them have shops, like many of the ones in my riding will have a shop class being provided, where there are extra costs being imposed on them because of the carbon tax that your government insists on imposing on everyone and punishing them, which is why not are so many people calling for a carbon tax selection. I had the opportunity uh, while we were away, uh, back in our ridings, again, meeting with our constituents like I was on the weekend. I got to do uh, the Calgary Food Drive, which is organized by the Church of Latter-day Saints. That is about a half a million pounds of food that is uh, collected just in one day, they shared with me the true intense cost of the carbon tax on food and how many families they're sharing. And the president of the stake informed me there are close to 200 families now that rely on the church to help them just to make ends meet because food has gotten so expensive because of the carbon tax. Like the, the fact that inflation has come back to something stable doesn't undo all the inflation and food costs that have been imposed over the last three to four years. That's an accumulation. People haven't seen an increase of 20 percent in their salaries. Their wages haven't gone up 20 percent. But the cost of food, in many cases, has gone up that high. Um, so I want to make that point that, you know, while I was back home in my riding in Calgary, I heard it directly at the doors as I was picking up the food out of vehicles and putting them to the bins for the Calgary food drive, that people are really hurting out there. And a carbon tax selection is not an inconvenience for, for Canadians in my riding. For the residents, it's not an inconvenience for them. They want to make it happen. So that's why the sub-amendment is so critically important. So I, I wanted to go and, again, I was quoting a few uh, provincial politicians about the need for a carbon tax election. And I've, I've gone through the effort of going through some more articles. I can offer you up some more quotes that agree with the sub-amendment that we do nothing until that carbon tax election is called, particularly on this subject. Um, again, I, I, like I had mentioned before, I had quoted uh, Sarah Hoffman, who had announced her bid for the leadership of the NDP. That's now resolved um, back in February 11, 2024. And on that day, this is like way before today, even back then she said that a carbon levy is dead. When talked about the federal carbon tax, she was quoted as saying, is dead, and it was in quotation marks right in the headline. And then here you have one of those direct quotes. I think the consumer carbon tax is dead. It died provincially in the last election. The feds took it over. It uses the prime minister's name. The prime minister played dirty politics with it and picked winners and losers. If you don't have public support, you can't carry on with something like that. She goes on, and then it quotes a few other provincial uh, members of the New Democratic Party. Uh, like I had mentioned before, Raki Pancholi, a two-term legislature member, who was also saying that the carbon tax is among the most press pressing issues for Albertans. At the time, she was still running for her leadership as well before she dropped out. Um, and I want to quote this one, because uh, it's from a former provincial cabinet minister for the New Democratic Party. Um, and she said... Uh, and this is Ganley, uh, she said, a Calgary legislature member and, and the first to put her name in the leadership race on Monday wouldn't address carbon pricing directly when asked about it. She then said, we'll have a lot of policies to release and a lot of things to say, but what I think is, what I think is I am in favor of policies that result in decarbonization. She said, my preference is to do that in a way that creates the most possible economic growth for the province. There's a lot of ways to achieve that goal, which if you read between the lines, she's basically saying the federal carbon tax makes no sense. And even during the NDP's provincial leadership campaign, uh, they talked about it as if it was an electoral issue that required an election, which is why I have this sub-amendment at the committee that puts a condition on when we would consider uh, the main motion, which I have uh, thoughts on the main motion, Chair, but I'll save that to the moment that we get to it. I also wanted to give you uh, an opportunity, Chair. I'm, I am also going to put a, no, uh, a notice of motion verbally because it uh, it's about the Immigration Refugee Board. I have it written down. I don't want to worry the clerk. I have it written down. I'll give it to him afterwards so he can uh, 
take a look at it. I want to continue with my NDP references. I want to make uh, Don Braid, which is a very well-known journalist in Calgary, uh, Edmonton, actually, very well respected. He's written for the Herald Edmonton Journal. Uh, this is the headline, Braid, an NDP leadership candidate startling opener, axe the carbon tax. That is not my leader speaking. That is the headline for an NDP member of the Legislative Assembly, a two-termer, starting with axe the carbon tax, uh, which implies that there would be an election and they would run on axing the carbon tax as well. Um, that was her opener, and this is the way it reads right at the beginning. Raki Pancholi doesn't enter the leadership race with a routine splash. Her opener is more like a cannonball from the high tower. The Edmonton MLA says it's time to dump the consumer carbon tax. Don Brake goes on to say, you are not hallucinating. She said what no NDP caucus member has said publicly before. And I agree. I remember when she made these comments. It was the talk of the town. We were all thinking that perhaps... Uh, the New Democrats provincially had seen the light, and there was definitely something going on that they had realized while door knocking, while talking to the residents, that they were very upset at all levels of government that they were imposing high costs, impossible costs to meet. When the price of food is going up by double digit percentage points, and you're seeing milk, which is eight, nine dollars, when you're seeing meat is expensive, fruit, vegetables are expensive, uh, you're really seeing the effects of the carbon tax directly for you. Uh, in the article, Don Braid offers the following quotes. I've been having many conversations with leading climate activists in our province, experts in this area. We need to continue those conversations to say, what would that climate plan look like without a consumer carbon price? Which, again, she's saying we need to move beyond the carbon tax. That it simply makes no sense, and it isn't worth continuing. Um, I have another one here from... Uh, Mr. McDonald's province now, because I, I wanted to quote all parties in, in this debate. So this is one here. Stung by by-elections laws, Fury has strong words for the Prime Minister and carbon tax. Premier says the Prime Minister has tried to bait me with name-calling. Uh, that seems awfully familiar. In fact, as I remember it, uh, during question period today about name-calling, our, our block colleague was reminding the Minister of Immigration that he name-calls and baits people into... Uh, having a back and forth that's not about policy, but it's about personalities. Now, Premier Fury says, the Prime Minister has tried, uh, and this is the clip, has tried to bait Fury with name-calling over carbon tax views, the Premier says. And it goes on to explain that despite the by-election loss that they experienced in their province, that the carbon tax is the primary issue. And he says here, on the carbon tax in particular, the Prime Minister has tried to bait me at times with certain ad hominems and name-calling almost. But look, we have a very different opinion of the carbon tax. It's not right for the people of the province right now, he said. I wish the Prime Minister would understand that. He's being very sclerotic in his approach on this ideolo ideologic marriage that he has to this principle. That's not to say that we don't believe in fighting climate change. We certainly do. But this policy is wrong. Hence, the need for my sub-amendment to wait until we can have a carbon tax election so the public can decide whether this government deserves to stay or whether there's a new group of people who will earn the right to govern and do right by the public. When even, I think, Premier Fury might be the last liberal premier in this country. I, I'm not quite sure. If he might be the last one, you're saying, yes, Mr. McDonald, leave it to, you know, the islanders on the rock to have the last liberal government. You know, I, you know maybe that'll change in the next uh, provincial election for the MHAs, and there'll be a new one. But it's the last provincial government left standing. That, that, that's unusual. I don't even think there's a liberal party of Alberta left anymore in my home province. So I wanted to uh, draw attention to that. I, I did say I had a notice of motion to give. I wanted to do it verbally because I wanted to make sure that they make... We should focus on this one. That's my, my understanding is. Yes, th that's why I'm giving a verbal notice of motion. I'm not going to be debating it. But I wanted to make sure that the Immigration Refugee Board and their chair is aware that uh, she's violated the law. So I'm just going to give notice of motion. I'll continue the debate on my sub-amendment. This is my motion that the committee, pursuant to Standing Order 1081A, order the production of all documents and records to all members of the Standing Committee on Citizenship and Immigration related to access to information and privacy, ATIPS, requests A-2022-02100, comma, A-2022-02101, comma, 
A-2022-02102. Comma, it's almost over. A-2022-02103, comma, and A-2022-02104. Point of order, Chair, just to make the life uh, and work of our interpreters easier, if we can provide them with the document that uh, our colleague is reading from. I'm, I'm almost finished, or maybe you can go a bit slower for the interpreters. Thank you for the reminder. I will go slower for the sake of our interpreters. Apologies. Sorry, uh, floor, I will give it to Kaibaga. I, I just called for a point of clarification. Is he moving a motion or no, just he's putting not, it on notice? He's, and not, he's allowed to do that, he's uh, giving clerk? A notice he's, he, not doing that. he's just giving a notice of motion. <clears throat> there will be no debate, and he's not moving it. I'll pause so I can continue here. So, uh, submitted to the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada concerning the January 2019 policy entitled Claims That Can Be Accepted Without a Hearing, in parenthesis, the January 2019 policy, which have exceeded statutory deadlines since February 2023. Point of order, Chair, I don't have the interpretation. Uh, Sorry, Mr. Mitchell, give us a few seconds. Okay. okay, please carry on. Uh, so I'll continue here. Which have exceeded statutory deadlines since February 2023 by over 20 months, including but not limited to all records related to the development, approvals process, and implementation of the January 2019 policy, and any amendments made to it as referenced in ATIP A-2022-02100. New, new section, the list of countries and subnational groups eligible for claims under the January 2019 policy, as well as any amendments to this list, all legal or policy-making authorities behind the publication of the list, and any record showing the process by which these countries and groups were added or removed from the list as referenced in ATIP A-2022-02100. All communications between the IRB and other government departments, agencies, ministerial offices, or the Prime Minister's office, as well as third-party stakeholders, regarding the development, finalization, and implementation of the January 2019 policy, as referenced in ATIP A-2022-02102, any records related to pilot projects undertaken prior to the announcement of the January 2019 policy that identified specific countries or subnational groups, including records about each pilot project, funding allocations, and the roles of officials involved in the projects, as referenced in ATIP A-2022-02103. Aggregate data regarding claims processed under the January 2019 policy, including positive versus negative determinations, the number of claims versus the total number of persons, and records pertaining to how claims were grouped outside the regular processing order, as referenced in ATIP A, dash 2022-02104, and that these documents be produced within 30 days. Thank you. I've also included all the original text of the language, so the references are in the back, and I'm happy to give it to the clerk so that uh, he has the information. I, th I thank the interpreters. I, I, I regret uh, speaking a little bit too fast and technically there, and that's my notice of motion, Chair. Um, my next article that, uh, that I found on City News was, again, uh, was referencing the premier of my province, was, and this is the headline, that urges feds to scrap inhumane carbon tax hike at House Committee. And that this is the reference of the committee appearance that uh, my premier, when she was here in Ottawa, made uh, around the April 1st announcement that the carbon tax, again, was going to go up $15 a carbon tonne. This is what she said. These are direct quotes. This isn't just reckless. It's immoral and inhuman, she said. I'm here on behalf of Albertans and Canadians who are struggling with severe financial pressures. She went on to say the solutions for the federal government um, 
is to increase the carbon tax on something that is life or death for Albertans in the extreme cold of winter. Um, and then she went on to remind the federal government that policies like these should be applied equally across all of Canada, and that when you create special exemptions for only one part of the country because they happen to use heating oil, as opposed to using clean burning natural gas like they do back home in Calgary and Edmonton and all the smaller towns, that it creates um, an unequal treatment of Canadians in Confederation, and it's unfair. Uh, and, you know, if committee members want to go, they can go to uh, the transcript of her appearance where she raised many points like this during her time there. Uh, the other one I wanted to reference as well was an article, and again, this backs up the need for my sub-amendment because it's not just me saying it, it's premiers saying it publicly, it's the public through their provincial officials uh, saying that they, they basically want uh, carbon tax election. They're all recognizing that it's a primary issue that's driving a lot of the commentary and the emails and the contacts, direct messages we get, and that people want to see a carbon tax ele election sooner than later. I'll remind all of us here that we're probably going to have a vote on that this Wednesday, and I hope that all opposition parties will join and vote yes to having that carbon tax election. Next article I have here is uh, BC to scrap carbon tax if Ottawa drops its alternate tax. That's Premier David Eby. What he means by the alternate tax is the federal backstop that is stopping uh, any province from attempting to remove its consumer carbon tax by backstopping through legislation uh, in the Greenhouse Gas uh, Pollution Pricing Act, the GGPP Act, that basically prevents them from not having one. It forces it on every single province. Uh, David Eby is quoted in the article, uh, and th these are some of the quotes I have here as Premier British Columbia. A lot of British Columbians are struggling with affordability, EB said. The political consensus we had in BC has been badly damaged by the approach of the federal government. So if it decides to remove the legal backstop requiring us to have a consumer carbon tax in BC, we will end the consumer carbon tax in BC, he said at an event in Vancouver alongside his wife, Kaylee Lynch, and Manitoba Premier Wab Canoe. And I, I wanted to also quote the Premier of Manitoba, who's also quoted in this article, but further down. And Premier Canoe said Thursday that he is in alignment with the Premier E.B. on the issue, having asked Ottawa for an exemption from carbon pricing in the spring. He believes the tax is not the right way to fight climate change at a time when high inflation and high interest rates are making life unaffordable for many. Uh, here's a direct quote. Um, I'm worried that the politicization of this issue is causing us to lose a generation of Canadians, causing us to lose so many people from the blue collar, uh, and we can't afford that. That's a direct quote. And it goes on and on and on like that, that there are concerns by premiers of our great country who are not of the same political affiliation that I am, who are saying the same things, which is the carbon tax is either wrong, immoral, inhuman, or that we need a carbon tax election, or that it has an electoral impact, which is why I have this sub-amendment before the committee, that uh, no action be taken until there's that carbon tax election. And that's what we could report back to the House on the matter. I, I think for now, I'm going to stop my commentary there, but I have more material. I have my binder with me all the time. And I'm happy to read more into the record from my residents and my riding and my constituents that have uh, honored me by sending me here to represent their views. Um, and I'm going to continue doing that, but I think for now that's enough, uh, having uh, provided chair the public school board's uh, very important feedback, because that, that I think what uh, President McNeil had said is incredibly important for the consideration of the sub-amendment, because it comes from school boards with our high cost, tens of millions of dollars being imposed on schools in Alberta, that is literally taking money away from educating uh, students for a tax on tax. That is his words, not mine. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Kimich. We will go to Mr. Al Khoury and then Mr. Arnold. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In response to my colleague, uh, Mr. Kimich, first of all, Mr. Chair, all world know that climate change is a serious problem. All humanity facing this problem. If we don't stand bravely, and face this problem and bring the adequate, the adequate solution to it. It means we are not preparing this country 
neither for us nor for our children nor for our the children of our children for generation to come we would like to prepare canada for our children and other generations for a cleaner air clean drinking water when no flood no forest fire no tornado no hurricane this is the way and the only way we could fight a climate change. Besides that, Mr. Chair, we all know that the federal government gives every province in Canada a big amount of money collecting from carbon tax to go to the pocket of citizens. That's number one. Number two, my colleague, Mr. Kamish, last time they said when I said Conservative vote against the food program to the student at schools. And he said that may jeopardize many business and will be obliged to close their business because of that. I wouldn't be surprised, Mr. Chair, because the policy of conservative is to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. And that's exactly and that's exactly what we are hearing and what we are experiencing at the moment over here. I will be surprised how come a party pre pretend that he is working for the citizen of Canada vote against this program when this program nine of ten family, the parents could go to work without having trouble in thinking about children. And how about those parents parent who cannot pay the fees for a private daycare. So this, for me, there is no explanation. There is no way to understand that behavior from a political party pretend he is looking for the interests of Canada. I will end up here for this, but I have many comments to say, Mr. Speaker. I believe this is clear from my side. Thank you. Mr. al -Khori, we have Mr. McLean on the list, next speaker, but Mr. Arnold is uh, appealing in for him. So, Mr. Arnold, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and it's an honor to be here with this committee, and uh, it's interesting to see Mr. McDonald. We sat on the same committee for uh, nine years now, and uh, on the same committee, we don't very often see each other in other committees, so it's a, a pleasure to be here with him. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm here to speak to Mr. Kimmich's uh, sub-amendment that this bill not be dealt with until a carbon tax election is held so that Canadians can vote out this out-of-time NDP Liberal Coalition government. Mr. Chair, I, I want to thank Mr. Kimmich for his quotes he provided from across party lines and across the country. Um, some of what he provided was about British Columbia. Being from British Columbia, from the North Okanagan, Shuswap, BC was one of the first provinces to implement a carbon tax. The BC Liberal government did that uh, a number of years ago. Now that BC Liberal government has had to change their party name because they no longer wanted to be affiliated with the federal Liberal government. And just a short weeks ago, the leader of that party, um, Mr. Kevin Falcon, was noted as saying he's not going to leave BC in a disadvantaged position when he announced that that party would scrap the carbon tax should they become elected. Since that point in time, he has uh, he's pulled their party out of the election uh, for reasons only he knows, but. Uh, the, the debate has now in BC become very interesting because Mr. David Eby, the Premier of BC, had called our leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, had called him out and called him, or saying that he was uh, basically working from a baloney factory when he talked about the carbon tax. Well, now there's been a flip-flop. And I would note that the BC NDP party is famous for flip-flops in election cycles. And Mr. Eby has stated that he would end the BC carbon tax if the federal backstop uh, was removed. That's an incredible flip-flop from a party that has supported 
carbon pricing for a long time. Uh, I will give him credit for living or listening to Canadians and to British Columbians that have spoken up. I've heard them all through the summer speaking about how fed up they are with the carbon tax and how it increases the cost of everything. And it's just becoming more and more frequently exposed that the Liberal NDP carbon tax is impacting Canadians and the Canadian economy, economy in devastating ways, and more and more Canadians are pushing back against it. This government has, has had to find ways of carving out carbon tax exemptions for certain Canadians in order to protect their votes. We've seen the carve out deals for home heating that started in Atlantic Canada when the Prime Minister's Atlantic caucus revolted and demanded a carve out, and then it had to be extended elsewhere to avoid discrimination by region over the carbon tax carve outs. Further, provincial premiers, as I mentioned, David Eby and more, have opposed the Prime Minister's plans to tax Canadians into submission. The latest being David Eby, as I mentioned, Premier David Eby, and it's happening across the country. He, Mr. Kimmich also mentioned Mr. Premier Fury in Newfoundland. That's across the country from coast to coast. Even our northern uh, territories are being punished by the carbon tax. Uh, this announcement by Premier Eby was only days before calling the BC provincial election. So many British Columbians, and being from there I'm hearing it, many British Columbians are asking questions like, is this simply an election ploy similar to the NDP, federal NDP leader's pre-by-election announcement that he was tearing up the supply agreement with the Liberals? Yes, Mr. Chair. Mr. Arnold, I don't see anything, but I, I mean, out of court, see, because if provincial government is not here to, to defend there, so instead of just focusing on this, uh, uh, you know, I think it's wise not to focus on, on the BC election through this, uh, this committee. That's what my feelings, and, uh, and I will let you continue with speaking. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, but I believe what is taking place in the BC election is very relevant to this uh, debate today because we're seeing how British Columbia has now shifted away from supporting the carbon tax. And that is what this sub-amendment is about. Uh, the leader of the, of the uh, federal NDP prior to that by-election st stated that the Liberals have let people down and the Liberals are too weak, too selfish and too beholden to corporate interest to fight for the people. Then immediately after the by-election in Winnipeg, that leader had another change of heart and announced he's going to continue to support the out-of-time Prime Minister, potentially just long enough to secure his own pension. Mr. Chair, the carbon tax increases the cost of everything for everyone. Over the summer, I met with met with and heard from the good people of the Okanagan, the Shushwap, and across BC. They are hardworking and they love their country. But what I heard them say was that taxes are up, costs are up, crime is up, and they are saying that time is up. At a grand opening of a large premises of, of a larger premises for a local food bank. Um, we heard that one in five Canadians skipped or reduced the size of at least one meal because they can't afford groceries. One in five parents ate less so that their children or other family members could eat. In Vernon, where this announcement took place, one in 23 families relied on the food bank in the last 12 months, and one in 13 kids in Vernon depended on the food bank last year. 30% of food bank users in Vernon are children. Many of those food bank work users are hardworking middle class families struggling to put food on the table, some already working two or more jobs. After nine years of this Liberal NDP government, those people have no confidence in this government and they want to see a carbon tax election. 
I also heard from business owners over the summer, one of whom showed me his carbon tax bills. His farm operation paid $100,000 in carbon tax in 2023. Carbon tax alone, $100,000. All of that cost had to be passed on to the consumer or the taxpayer who pays the carbon tax accumulated on every food item they buy. That farmer told me that under the current regime, it was not worth running his full operation. So he laid off 55 employees and set $30 million worth of equipment into idle mode because he can't operate effectively and economically under the current carbon tax regime. Thus, by shutting down that food supply chain, he probably drove up consumer costs, adding to the overall debt because of, of um, unemployment, employment insurance costs and borrowing. Mr. Chair, it's cases like this that I've heard and cases of seniors who received an announcement that their pension checks would be increasing only to find out their GIS su supplement payments would be decreased by a larger amount, leaving them with less to buy groceries, get to medical appointments, or heat their homes. Many of those who called were in tears because they didn't know if they were going to be forced out onto the streets because of the increased carbon tax costs and rising costs of basic living. I hear from assistance workers who are having to speak, they're having to seek mental health guidance because they've heard so many of these difficult to hear cases of seniors not being able to survive because of increased costs. Mr. Chair, I could go on much more because of what's happened in British Columbia. You urged me not to bring the BC election into this, but because it's a time of a BC election and it has become a very much a carbon tax election in British Columbia, as we've seen leader after leader after leader speak out against the carbon tax. Canadians have had enough of the carbon tax and they want to get to a carbon tax election now. So I would encourage all members of this committee to grasp the severity of the situation for Canadians and give them a chance immediately to participate in a carbon tax election. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. We will go to Mr. McGuire. My dear friend, Larry, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to Mr. Kimmich's uh, sub uh, amendment here as well on this uh, particular topic uh, that has come before us, uh, brought by the Liberals um, in the discussion, and uh, I think it's very, very relevant that we move towards a carbon tax election, and I have some thoughts on that that I want, wish to share with the committee at this time as well. Um, you know, Mr. Kamich's sub-amendment says that, uh, uh, that after the temporary foreign workers, we should add the following words, quote, after, and after a carbon tax election is held so that Canadians and Quebecois can vote out this tired, out-of-time NDP Liberal Coalition government, end quote. Um, and, and, Mr. Speaker, there's been lots of uh, relevant comments made by my colleagues here today already, but I, uh, I find it unfortunate that, uh, that this coalition, which was existing for the last couple of half years, two and a half years or more, has uh, found, uh, uh, well, it's a bit encouraging that they decided that they wouldn't have that, uh, maybe the NDP walked away from that, but uh, in every day since then, it's very obvious that that coalition is still alive and well. So, Mr. Speaker, I just want to, or uh, Mr. Chair, I should say, I just want to thank you uh, for the discussion that we're able to have here in the chamber today uh, in this committee, and I appreciate that opportunity to discuss the sub-amendment before us, which typically, or specifically, adds uh, the lines, as I've, as I've said. The fact of the matter is, Canadians 
should be given that opportunity to decide whether or not uh, they still have faith in the Liberals and the NDP after their disastrous coalition and failed policy, positions and policies, which have left many individuals and families, young couples, workers, seniors, and so on, struggling to make ends meet. Even even some of the words that the, that the Liberal uh, put for the Liberals put forward in this motion uh, in in you know by themselves, uh, they uh, alerted the concerns of many different sectors. Uh, but they haven't done anything to really meet the struggles uh, of the people that are having trouble making ends meet. Uh, I had a flat tire the other day, Mr. Speaker, and Chair, Mr. Chair, and I, I actually had the opportunity of, of uh, getting in a cab to go back to get my car when they've got it fixed. And the fellow had given me a ride in Brandon. It's not that big a city, but he recognized me and uh, said, you're Mr. McGuire, member of parliament. And I said, yes. And he said, well, I just want you to take the message back that I've been here for 12 years in Canada. There was lots of jobs and good paying uh, jobs when I was there, but I'm having a struggle to find a job now other than driving this cab. And I know many of my colleagues that have come from other parts of the world are having that trouble now as well. And, and he said it's a struggle to make ends meet. And I couldn't believe what came out of his mouth next. He said, you know, my rent's gone up, my cost of food's gone up, and I'm having a struggle to make ends meet for my family. This is a prime example, uh, Mr. Chair, I believe, of what's happening across Canada, and that's why we've been so insistent as a Conservative Party in calling for a carbon tax election. To leave the money in people's pockets to start with, rather than taking it out of their pockets and trying to redistribute it, and I'll get into that more in my discussion here uh, in, you know, in some time. Um, but, you know, poll after poll, as I've been referring to it, it make it very clear that Canadians demand, um, they demand change. Uh, this gentleman that I was speaking to that I was writing with the other day is one of those. Um, you know, 62% rule, I guess, is what I was going to say there. Um, one of the things that I learned very early in my political career was that, uh, from pollsters and others, is that when 62 percent of, of any particular um, group of Canadians, in the cases when I was a provincial MLA, if 62 percent of those people don't like your leader, you're not going to win the election. Well, we're well ahead of that in regards to where we're at between the, with just the Liberals alone. And if you put them together with the NDP, well, you know, we're well over 75 to 80 percent. And I, I think it's, uh, my colleagues just uh, uh, reminded me here that it was Mr. Trudeau alone that decided to call a, an early election in 2021, right in the middle of COVID. It was very unnecessary to, to call at that time. And, and uh, it's, it's Canadians' turns to have the, uh, the election that they want uh, and allow them to call it at this time. And so we've been, I've had my ear to the ground, the same as my colleague to my left and my colleagues to the right here. Um, you... Mr. Chair as well, and uh, Vice Chair, and I think it's uh, it's incumbent upon the government of the day to pay specific attention to these Canadians. Um, those were the best economic times when that happened in Manitoba. Uh, the government of the day in Manitoba had ten of the best years of economic activity ever in the province. Um, and they did go on the NDP to win that election. But this isn't the case here now. We've got the biggest debt that we've ever had in this country, and the case is being made by individuals that they cannot be taxed anymore in this country. They know that the overspending and uh, in, during COVID, and I only use that word because the part of it's backed up by the parliamentary budget officer that said that 40% of the $500 billion that they spent on in, to adjust to the COVID crisis, had nothing to do with COVID. So that's why I refer to that. Um, and so after nine years of Justin, of, of, of the Prime Minister, um, taxes are up, the costs are up, crime is up. And, you know, I mean, uh, it's easy to say the time is up too, because time is up for these Canadians. They just can't, they just can't make ends meet. I mean, I've said taxes are up because we've got the biggest debt. Uh, costs are up because of the inflationary spending of the government. Crime is up because they're too soft on things like bail, where 
the record amount of people let on bail, there's been a record amount of murders by people let out on bail in Canada, 256, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, which is up over 100 in the last four years alone. Uh, these are things that Canadians see every day in their lives, and they're, they're, to be blunt, they're sick and tired of it. There's really a lot of reasons why the Prime Minister should be listening to Canadians and why the opposition parties, um, other than ourselves, who have been listening, should be calling for this, this uh, carbon tax election as well. It's a tired, out-of-touch NDP Liberal coalition government, uh, and they must give the people a chance to vote to show Canadians there's, uh, you know, whose interests they're, they're saying they're trying to defend. So over long, nine long years, this coalition under the Prime Minister has imposed policies that have made life affordable for Canadians. I'm not talking just about things like Bill C-69, Mr. Mr. Chair now, um, but there's many others as well that I've referred to in the, in the areas of crime and, and, uh, and costs. They promised that the carbon tax would somehow make us richer, but instead it's contributed to the rising costs of every Canadian family. It's become more difficult, not less, for folks to feed their families, eat their homes, and drive to work, even get their kids to things, uh, events, um, and, and, and school. So, Mr. Mr. Chair, it is time for Canadians to be heard. Uh, I'm saying that the numbers tell a story. The reality of the carbon tax is that it's a financial burden on working Canadians. According to the Fraser Institute, by 2030, the first carbon tax will cost the average worker $6,700. That's only six years away, Mr. Chair. Um, today, the premiers are rebelling, as my colleague has referred to. My colleague who was here has referred to from British Columbia. Uh, the same thing's happening with the election that's been called in New Brunswick. I know the same thing in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and other provinces. The premiers have all indicated that they are uh, concerned that the carbon tax has, co has helped increase this cost of living. So, Mr. Chair, it's, uh, it's uh, definitely uh, important that the government pay attention. But now, instead of doing anything about that, they've caused a second carbon tax, and it's set to cost our economy another $9 billion by that same year, 2030. That's billions of dollars drained from our economy. More importantly, Mr. Chair, it's 164,000 jobs are projected to be lost. This is the last thing hardworking Canadians de need during a cost-of-living crisis, to be losing their jobs. But that's what's happening across the country. This tax isn't just about abstract numbers, Mr. Chair. It's affecting all of us every single day. The Canadian Trucking Alliance tells us that by 2030, trucking costs will rise by $4 billion due to the carbon tax. That's atrocious. That's money that truckers can't absorb, which means higher prices for all the goods they transport. Everything from food to clothing and essentials. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair, rather, this is paid for by Canadians, nearly 50 percent of whom, according to studies, show that they are within $200 of insolvency at the end of every paycheck. Now, who could be heartless enough to not pay attention to what's going on with those kinds of numbers? We dealt with it during COVID, but it wasn't dealt with well. As I've previously explained, 40 percent of the money was wasted. We don't know where it went. And I'm only quoting the public budget, the parliamentary budget officer. So if he doesn't know where it went, how should we? Um, is it right that Canadian families are now paying $700 more for food? This is something that the taxi driver in Brandon mentioned to me the other day, this year, and every year to follow. That's $700 more than last year, Mr. Mr. Chair. And this is a, a considerable increase in the ability to not only feed our families, but, you know, make sure that these, that their family members, their kids, are uh, able to not go to school hungry and make sure that they can have the best opportunity to, to learn that they possibly can. So I want to ask, is it right that millions of people are lining up outside food banks, relying on them to survive? And I've raised the particular case that we have in Brandon many times in the House of Commons over the last while, and I know it's happening across Canada. 
But tragically, people across the country are finding themselves in this situation, including many, in my, as I mentioned in my writing of Brandon and Brandon Soros. This is an excerpt from an article published on Discover Westman earlier this year. And I quote, Mr. Mr. Chair, Samaritan House Ministries saw an alarming increase in the number of food hampers they gave out last year. They go on to say that the downtown Brandon Food Bank averages 24,000 food hampers, food hampers in any given year. The pandemic created fluctuations in those numbers. However, in 2022, they were back to their normal average of 24,000 hampers in 2022. What's astonishing is in 2023, Samaritan House saw an astounding increase of just under 12,000 hampers. And this was just from their own food bank. Food banks across the country have seen this trend, and it's not slowing down anytime soon. 2023, it goes on to say, was an amazing year in lots of ways, but also startling, shares Executive Director Barbara McNish. We had 1,052 new people use the food bank last year who have never used it before and were returning after years of not using it, or were, were returning after years of not using it, she says. So before 2019, we were serving about 24,000 hampers in a year, and then, of course, COVID hit, and we were down. And then the province helped with the nutrition, so our numbers went up if we include the hampers dealing with nutrition. So that went anywhere from 25,000 to 28,000, if you include the nutrition hampers. In 2022, it went back down to 24,000, which would be our normal, states McNish. Last year was 2023. For 2023, we served 35,967 hampers to people. This was a great increase, and that's alarming. She closes by saying, and when you see the staggering numbers that are coming new or renewed, plus those who are already existing, she adds, you can see that people are in need. End of that article, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. This isn't the Canada we believe in, but the carbon tax has contributed to, those, to these troubling trends. <clears throat> We've got a couple more things here, Mr. Chair, and then I'll, uh, I'll let my colleague have the floor. Meanwhile, the Liberal government continues to insist that this tax is, is the solution, despite all evidence to the contrary. The tax doesn't, does nothing for the environment while punishing families, workers, and small businesses. It's merely a tax grab disguised as environmental policy. Yes, this measure has been supported by the NDP in Parliament dozens of times, even as 80 percent of Canadians are worse off due to the current system. The parliamentary budget officer has stated that most families pay more in carbon tax than they receive in rebates. This year alone, Manitoba families, those born in the prairies and those who choose our provinces, chose our province as their new home, will face an additional $1,750 in cost due to the carbon tax. On top of that, Canadian taxpayers will also be paying an extra $486 million in GST as a result of it. This has placed an unnecessary financial burden on families and businesses, all while failing to deliver the promised environmental benefits. In fact, Canada's ranking in the Climate Change Performance Index recently fell to 62nd out of 67 countries, highlighting the ineffectiveness of this policy. There's lots more I could say, Mr. Chair, but I'll leave it at that for now and, uh, and pass the uh, uh, floor to my colleague. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Uh, Mr. McLean, you were not here earlier, but someone was uh, in filling for you, Mr. Arnold, so we gave your spot to him and we put you back on the list. And uh, now Mr. Radikoff is on the list, but Mr. Hallen is, is uh, in filling for him. So Mr. Hallen's spot <coughs> is yours. You, let you on the list, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's great to be back. Welcome. You're here. <coughs> Mr. Okay, hold on one second. The speaking uh, speaking order is this. Mr. Radikoff, which Mr. Hallen will take the spot, then Mr. Kamich, then Madam Kaibaga, and then MP McLean. Thank you, Mr. Hallen. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Great to be back on the committee after a while. A lot has changed in this committee, but I guess the only thing that hasn't changed is the Liberal NDP Kossi coalition is still together. Um, I find it uh, quite shameful <laughs> that... Um, I'll start off my remarks. Um, actually, it's, it, since Ms. Kwan wants to uh, speak up, I guess we'll, we'll start with the original motion of C-71. Uh, I'll just say it's quite shameful um, that we had a common-sense conservative bill, Bill uh, S-245, in front of us that was a very common-sense conservative bill that should have given lost Canadian citizenship. It was a very straightforward bill. One person at a time, please. And uh, Thank you. It's, it's shameful Honorable that... Honourable members, you know that because it's, it's hard for interpreters and... Other technical staff, you know, let if uh, you want the floor, please raise your hand and I will be happy to give you the floor. So the floor is only with Mr. Holland and Mr. Holland should be the only one that is making remarks at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I was saying I find it quite shameful that uh, Ms. Kwan, who also came here as an immigrant like myself, would hold hostage a bill in Bill S245 that could have given lost Canadian citizenship immediately. But once again, she teamed up with the corrupt Liberal government and completely lost hope for all the lost Canadians that were looking forward to that bill. I had many people reach out to me about that. Much like this Liberal NDP government has held hostage an election that Canadians desperately want a carbon tax election at that. You know, when I look around the room, even on the, the liberal side, and chair yourself, we all came here as immigrants, and our, and our great immigration shadow minister, the greatest shadow immigration minister that the Conservative Party has had, in my opinion. We all came here as immigrants. We had the chance to work hard, play by the rules, and become citizens. And now we get to have the honour and responsibility of sitting here in Parliament. But I find it very shameful that Ms. Kwan would take that away from those lost Canadians. She took that hope away. Yeah, keep it coming, man. Oh, I will. Um, but now, like I said, now they've held hostage this, this Parliament and an election, a carbon tax election away from Canadians that they desperately want. This carbon tax scam was sold by this Liberal NDP government as lies that are clear to see now, more than ever. First, they lied and said that this carbon tax scam somehow would fix the environment, that all the floods and all the fires would somehow miraculously be fixed. We know that's not true. And it's not just us saying it. It's the government's own department that says they don't measure the carbon tax scam, what it does compared to emissions, because they know it's like the Prime Minister, it's not worth the cost. There's nothing that directly says, by raising the carbon tax scam, somehow the environment will get fixed. That was line number one that they sold about the carbon tax scam. Proven wrong once again. The second lie was how somehow Canadians are supposed to get back more than what they pay into the scam. Again, that was proven wrong over and over and over again by the government's own parliamentary budgeting officer. I had the chance to question him as well. He said it on multiple occasions, that when you factor in the fiscal and economic impact of the carbon tax, most households are at a net loss, at a net loss, and that goes for all the provinces where this applies. So that was line number two that was proven wrong. And now this costly Liberal NDP coalition wants to quadruple the carbon tax scam. They want to make the already expensive gas, groceries and home heating more expensive by quadrupling the scam. They already know that two million Canadians are going into a food bank in a single month because of their failed policies. They know another million are going there this year. They know that families are going to pay another $700 in the cost of groceries this year. They know all of this. 
they know they've doubled the housing costs with the failed policies. But again, because of their radical ideology, they refuse to listen to the 70 percent, a majority of Canadians that said, do not raise the carbon tax scam. They refuse to listen to them. It's because of their radical ideology. And why is Ms. Kwan and the NDP doing this? Well, it's clear to see. Their leader is up for a $2.2 million pension. That's why, in fact, they've they voted in favor of the carbon tax scam 24 times, 24 times. All for the greed of their leader being able to get his pension. And that is why they're holding this parliament hostage now because of this carbon tax scam. They refuse to give Canadians the election that they want and the one that they deserve, the carbon tax election. And this, the bill S245, which I want to take some time to thank my brilliant Senate colleague, uh, Senator Yona Martin, for putting in the work she did for that bill and getting it to where it, where it was. It's, again, it's sad to see that this Liberal NDP government uh, totally let down those those uh, the lost Canadians that had hope in that. But when we talk about newcomers, after nine years of this government, newcomers are the one of the most hit with with the failed economic policies of this costly coalition. As I said before, we all came. Most of us here that are sitting on this committee as members, we came here as immigrants. But why did we come here? There was something before Justin Trudeau that was called the Canadian dream. That dream meant you were able to work hard, put in effort, you would be able to afford a home, afford groceries, and live in safe communities. But because of wacko and radical policies by this costly coalition, none of that is true anymore. So much so that a lot of newcomers question, why did we come here? What was the point of moving here? We left everything behind, and we were promised that we would be able to have an affordable home, groceries, and safe communities. But when they get here, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare because this government has doubled housing costs. They've, they gave Canadians 40-year highs in inflation because of their out-of-control spending. That, that gave Canadians also the most rapid interest rate hikes in Canadian history. Violent crime, auto theft, extortions, everything is on the rise. And now, even small businesses that are the backbone of our economy, there's more insolvencies. There's less and less people that want to invest in Canada because Canada is not somewhere where you can succeed anymore under this government. It's clear to see in the numbers. I think there was a number last year around 400,000 people left Canada. They left Canada. It's incredible. And some of the reasons, the top reasons why people are leaving Canada, number one, the cost of living. And number two is because their credentials don't get recognized. And I'll put in a plug for a common sense conservative promise that we're going to put forward after we have a common sense conservative government under our leader, is the National Blue Seal Program which will ensure our brilliant immigrants, that includes the 20,000 doctors and 30,000 nurses that live in Canada today that, can't, that aren't licensed because of this red tape and bureaucracy, that within 60 days, if they can prove their skill and take a test, they will be able to work in the field that they're supposed to work in so that we can get more doctors and nurses into our healthcare system. And... What we'll also do is make sure that we're building the homes and axing the tax, this carbon tax scam, once, once we do form government, so that people actually want to stay here. That we bring back that Canadian dream that we all got to realize. And it's sad the Liberal NDP classy coalition doesn't want others to see that same Canadian opportunity or Canadian dream that we got to see. So much so that we have people leaving in record numbers. And once again, it's really sad to see that all of this, all of this pain and suffering that Canadians are having to be put through is because the NDP is greedy for their, their leader's $2.2 million pension. That's it. 
That's all this is all about. Their leader put on this grand theater last two, the two weeks ago, where he said he ripped up the agreement. He made a big deal out of it. He wouldn't stop saying, I ripped it up, I ripped it up, I ripped it up. And we said, I don't, we, we said, I don't think that that's true. And it only took a week after that where he said, no, I taped it right back up. I used the people in Winnipeg for the by-election that I almost lost. And now I don't need those votes in Winnipeg. So now he taped up that agreement once again and says he has full confidence in the most ethically corrupt prime minister in Canadian history. Yeah, yeah. The one that has doubled housing costs, the one who's let crime, chaos, drugs and disorder run rampant in our communities. The leader of the NDP sold out and said, once again, he has full confidence in that same prime minister and that same government. And now Canadians have to suffer even more because this radical ideology isn't going anywhere because they're promising they will inflict even more pain by quadrupling the carbon tax scam. And even this costly coalition knows how bad it is. That's why they hid a report, a secret report that their department hid that proved that around $30 billion is the hole that this carbon tax scam puts into our national GDP. That proved that around $30 billion is the hole that this carbon tax scam puts into our national GDP. They hid that report. It took a lot for the PBO to come out about that. <clears throat> all of this, all of this for a $2.2 million pension. Newcomers that we talk to all the time, they have lost hope. These are the, some of them have to sleep in their cars as we're hearing. Some of the students are living under bridges, but it wasn't their fault. It wasn't their fault at all. They were promised one thing, and when they got here, reality was something completely different from what they were promised. It's not their fault that this costly coalition opened the doors and said, come on in, and then blamed them for the housing crisis. This is what incompetence looks like. First, we had Sean Frazier, the then incompetent immigration minister, the now incompetent housing minister, and he passed the torch down to someone, in my opinion, is even more incompetent, Mark Miller, who doesn't even know his own file. And all they did was blame the same immigrants that they said could come here. They opened the door for them, then blamed them. It's like inviting someone to your house and then blaming them for eating all the food and taking up all the beds, even though you invited them. This is the reality. And that's why this prime minister is so unpopular today. It's clear to see. Anyone you talk to is feeling the pain of failed policies by this Liberal NDP government. And again, this, this sub-amendment brought forward by my, my brilliant colleague, Tom Kamich, it highlights, it highlights something that Canadians are asking for everywhere we go. Canadians are tired. Instead of... Instead of getting approval from Canadians, this costly coalition will continue on their radical path to quadruple the carbon tax scam. I say and we say, let's give Canadians the opportunity. Let's put it before Canadians. Let's pause the carbon tax scam. And I hope Ken will agree, because he's spoken out against it. But let's put it before Canadians. Let Canadians decide, do they want more of this costly coalition that will tax your food, your, your gas, and your home heating, and make it even more expensive with this carbon tax scam? Or do Canadians want a common-sense conservative government under Prime Minister Pierre Polyev that will axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime, and bring home that Canadian dream that we all once knew, and that country that we all love and that we all once knew before. Let's put it before Canadians and call in a carbon tax election now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Uh